In this video, I'm going to introduce the Hamiltonian, and we'll discuss how we can use the Hamiltonian to investigate some classical systems. So we're going to discuss the Hamiltonian, and I'm gonna write the Hamiltonian as this kind of cursive H, uppercase H, and so far in the class, we've seen the Lagrangian. So the Lagrangian we defined as the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. And I'll simplify things down to one dimension. Our Lagrangian was a function of the velocities and positions and maybe the time for some system and what these coordinates represented are the state space and using the Lagrangian we could use we could find the Euler Lagrange equations and solve that to get our equation of motion for whatever system we were interested in studying. So the Hamiltonian is going to be uh, closely related to the Lagrangian. And in fact, in some cases, we need to use the Lagrangian to determine what our Hamiltonian is. So in some cases, the Hamiltonian is just the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. And we'll talk about what cases those are in a second. More generally, so this applies to all cases, the Hamiltonian is defined as a momentum P that we'll talk about in a second times a velocity minus the Lagrangian. So what is this P? So this is called the generalized momentum. And we can find it by taking the partial of our Lagrangian with respect to velocity. So if you remember our Euler-Lagrange equations, this partial with respect to velocity, the partial derivative with respect to velocity is then what we would take the total time derivative of. So maybe I'll just write that down here. Euler-Lagrange equations were the taking that partial derivative, then taking the total time derivative, minus the partial with respect to position equals zero. So this term that we take the total derivative of in our new way of thinking about things with the Hamiltonian is actually the generalized momentum P. So if the Lagrangian was a T minus V, and we said that was a function of the velocity, position, and time. And the Lagrangian lives in something that we call state space. And the Hamiltonian, as we're going to see, sometimes uh, you can just write it as the kinetic plus potential energy. And so we're going to write the Hamiltonian as a function of momentum, position, and time. And so now that we're using position as one of our variables, this is going to be, the Hamiltonian is going to represent phase space.
So if you ever see someone talking about something like state space or phase space, they're either talking about the Lagrangian or they're talking about the Hamiltonian. So let's do a simple example to see what this looks like. So we'll do the Hamiltonian for a particle in free space. And so what that means is there's just no potentials, there's no forces acting on this particle. So our Lagrangian is just T minus V. There's no potential, so this is just the kinetic energy. And we'll just stick with one dimension for now. So the potential derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to x dot is just mx dot. And that's what we are defining as the generalized momentum P. So in this case, it's just the regular momentum that we might expect, mass times velocity. Uh, but this generalized momentum is not always going to map exactly to that. OK. So this is now our Lagrangian. So how do we get to our Hamiltonian? So Hamiltonian, we said, is defined as the momentum times x dot minus the Lagrangian. So our momentum is mx dot. And our we're going to multiply that times another x dot. And then we subtract our Lagrangian, which is 1 half mx dot squared. So this becomes mx dot squared minus 1 half mx dot squared, which equals mx dot squared over 2, or 1 half mx dot squared. So this is the Hamiltonian. And we could have seen if we just did our definition of Hamiltonian equals T plus V. The potential is zero, so this just becomes kinetic energy, and that equals one half and x dot squared. So this is a case where we could have just skipped the this intermediate step and just jumped straight to defining the Hamiltonian as the kinetic plus potential energy. So then the question becomes, when, when to use the Hamiltonian equals P x dot minus Lagrangian, or when to skip to the Hamiltonian equals T plus V. And so the simple answer is you can skip straight to the T plus V if the forces or potentials in your situation are conservative. So you can skip to the Hamiltonian equals T plus V only when the forces or potentials are conservative. So in this case, there were no forces or potentials. So another way of thinking about this is, in other words, the potential energy does not depend on the velocity. So in this case, our potential is zero, so it certainly doesn't depend on the velocity. 
And so we can just jump straight to this definition of Hamiltonian equals T plus V. But if you're ever in a situation where you don't know uh, if your force is conservative or not, and or you just aren't confident, uh, you can always do the this definition in the red box. So this will always be true. And even if you maybe have to do a little bit of extra work, uh, this will always give you the correct Hamiltonian. Whereas if you, you might mistakenly assume that T plus V is valid, and there might be a situation where that's not a correct assumption to make. So it's always safer to just use the equation in the red box. Okay, so now that we have our Hamiltonian, uh, what are we going to do with it? So once you have your Hamiltonian now, we're going to use Hamilton's equations. So these function uh, analogously to how we use the Euler-Lagrange equations in Lagrangian mechanics. So the Hamilton's equations look like this. So the x dot, or the velocity term, equals the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to momentum, and the time derivative of momentum equals the negative partial derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to position. So in the example that we just did, our Hamiltonian was 1 half m x dot squared. And our momentum was p, which was m x dot. So now typically what you want to do is rewrite your Hamiltonian in terms of the generalized momentum that you found. So if I square both sides here, I get m squared x dot squared. If I solve for x dot squared, because that's what's in my Hamiltonian, I'll get p squared over m squared. So if we plug that into our Hamiltonian now, we get m times p squared over m squared, and that reduces down to p squared over 2m for our Hamiltonian. Okay, so now we can take the derivative of that Hamiltonian with respect to p to find x dot. And that just becomes p over m. Now we'll take the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to position. We were just a particle moving in free space, so there was no uh, position dependence. So our p dot just equals 0. Now, the equation on the right is a p dot. So we can make the equation on the left look like p dot by just taking a time derivative. So the left side becomes x double dot, and the right side becomes p dot over m. And in this example, we're just assuming that there's no change in the mass. Now we have these two equations that are in terms of p dot. So let's solve the, this equation for p dot, and it just becomes mx double dot. Now that both equations are in terms of p dot, we can set them equal to each other. And we'll get mx double dot equals 0. So this is maybe a trivial solution, but this is just saying that a particle in free space doesn't have any acceleration because there's no forces or potentials to change its motion. So this is exactly what we would, we expect to see. <laughs> 
Okay, so now let's do an example that's maybe a little more involved and something that we've seen several times now in our discussion of classical mechanics. And so now we'll discuss the classical harmonic oscillator with Hamiltonian mechanics. Okay, so our harmonic oscillator will just be a mass on a spring, mass m, spring constant k. Our Lagrangian is t minus v. Our kinetic energy is 1 half mx dot squared. And our potential energy is 1 half kx squared. And so our Lagrangian just becomes 1 half mx dot squared minus 1 half kx squared. OK, let's use this Lagrangian to figure out what our momentum is, our generalized momentum. So the generalized momentum P is the partial derivative of Lagrangian with respect to x dot. So the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to x dot looks like this. The potential doesn't, deter, doesn't depend on x dot, so that partial derivative goes to 0. And then the partial derivative of 1 half mx dot squared is just mx dot. So this is our generalized momentum. Next, we want to write down our Hamiltonian. Let's say we don't know if this force is conservative or not. So we'll just do the long version, p x dot minus l gives us our Hamiltonian. p we said was mx dot, so this is mx dot times x dot minus 1 half mx dot squared minus 1 half kx squared. This is mx dot squared minus 1 half mx dot squared minus, or now plus, 1 half kx squared. So our Hamiltonian is just 1 half mx dot squared plus 1 half kx squared. And so that was just the more simple version of t plus v. So we could have uh, just jumped straight to that if you had remembered that springs, the spring force is a conservative force. Okay. But we didn't have to necessarily assume that, and we get the same result anyways. Okay, so now the next step, so we have this as our Hamiltonian. Oops. And we want to rewrite it in terms of the generalized momentum, which we had defined as mx dot. So again, if we square both sides here, we'll get something that looks like this. And we want to solve that for x dot, because that's what we're going to plug in to our Hamiltonian, because there's an x dot squared. So we have 1 half m times p squared over m squared plus 1 half kx squared. And so this just reduces down to p squared over 2m plus 1 half kx squared. And just a word of caution, the, the Hamiltonian won't always look like p squared over 2m. There can be more complicated relationships between the momentum the generalized momentum and your velocity terms. But uh, since we're doing easy examples for now, uh, we are getting this p squared over 2n. OK, so we have our Hamiltonian in terms of momentum and position. Now we need our um, Hamilton equations. 
P dot equals negative partial of derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to position. The partial derivative of Hamiltonian with respect to position is just kx. So p dot equals kx. And then there's a negative sign on that from this negative up here. The other Hamiltonian or Hamilton equation is x dot equals partial derivative of Hamiltonian with respect to momentum. That just becomes p over m. So if we solve this for p, then we get p equals mx dot. And the other Hamilton equation had a p dot. So let's take time derivatives of both sides to get p double, or sorry, to get p dot on the left and mx double dot on the right. Now we have two equations that equal p dot. So we can set them equal to each other. And we get mx double dot equals negative kx. And so this is just the, uh, and I guess I can simplify it a little bit by moving the m to the other side. And now this is just the familiar uh, equation of motion for the harmonic oscillator. And so it has the solutions that we have seen before. X as a function of t equals a cosine of omega t, where omega equals square root k over m. So the simple example is to show that the approach with the Hamiltonian will give you the same results as the approach with Lagrangian mechanics or even all the way back to doing uh, Newtonian mechanics. So all of these um, processes yield consistent results, which is what we expect. Uh, our physics has to be the same, just different ways of thinking about it and working through the different situations. So the steps for using the Hamiltonian or using Hamiltonian mechanics. So the first two steps are similar to what we need in um, Lagrangian mechanics. So you have to define your coordinate system. Including whatever constraints you want to use. And the constraints are what can help you go from maybe something that is moving in three dimensions to uh, some coordinate transformation or some constraint that allows the motion to be thought of as just something moving in one or two dimensions. Then you'll write down your kinetic and potential energies. And that would be using the coordinates that you defined in step one. Then for step three, we can have two, two different paths you can take basically. So if the forces slash potentials are conservative, You can just write down the Hamiltonian. As T plus V. 
But if you're not confident in that, you can just always do this approach where you write down the Lagrangian. So once you have your Lagrangian, you can find the generalized momentum. P, and that equals the partial derivative of Lagrangian with respect to velocity. Then with your generalized momentum, we can write down the Hamiltonian. And in this case, the Hamiltonian equals the, that momentum times velocity minus the Lagrangian. Once you have your Hamiltonian, you want to rewrite it. in terms of momentum and position, then use Hamilton's equations. And so in these one dimensional examples that I've been using, those equations look like this. Partial the p dot is the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to position. And then x dot is the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to momentum. And then the last step is to solve for the equations of motion. using those two Hamilton equations from step five. So this is the general procedure for uh, working through problems with the Hamiltonian. And now it honestly is a little bit more work than just doing the Lagrangian. So you might be asking yourself why use the Hamiltonian at all? So the nice thing is that the Lagrangian and the Hamiltonian will give you the same results. So for some, for whatever reason, you might just like the Hamiltonian more, and then that's perfectly fine if you want to use it. Um, a more concrete reason is that because so because the Hamiltonian. is just the total energy with that caveat being in conservative systems. So the Hamiltonian is just the total energy. So whereas the Lagrangian was kinetic minus potential energy, and that doesn't necessarily correspond to a quantity that has any physical meaning. The Hamiltonian, in the case where it just equals kinetic plus potential energy, that's just the total energy of your system. So the Hamiltonian is actually related to a physical quantity, the energy, and so you might feel more comfortable doing Hamiltonian mechanics because the underlying equation that you're using the Hamiltonian is related to a very important physical quantity being the total energy of the system. And with that in mind, uh, things like quantum mechanics were developed using the Hamiltonian.
So any introductory quantum mechanics class that you're going to take, uh, you're going to be doing a lot with the Hamiltonian. And so it's important to understand the Hamiltonian and how to work with it, because a lot of quantum mechanics is developed using the Hamiltonian. Uh, so those are just a couple of reasons why you might want to use the Hamiltonian. Uh, but now you have an extra tool in your toolkit, in addition to the Lagrangian, that you can use to tackle these classical mechanics problems.